The year is 1846. A British cartographer is creating maps for North India. He hovers over a small stretch of land beyond the Kirkram mountain range. He is uncertain. A few months back, he would written a letter to the Viceroy in Canton of the Chinese government. He would invited the Viceroy to a meeting to discuss the borders and finalize the demarcation of the Indo-Chinese border. The nearest to a reply the British received to that invitation was the evasive observation by the Canton Viceroy that it would be easier to leave the border as it is. Neither side should try to fix them. It would not be worth the effort. The borders of these territories have been sufficiently and distinctly fixed, so that it will be best to adhere to this ancient arrangement, and it will prove far more convenient to abstain from any additional measures for fixing them. The cartographer collects his thoughts, refills his pen, and writes, Terra Incognita. 150 years later, India and China would go to war over this small strip of land. Maps from the 1870s show that the British laid claim to this region, but in reality, neither British India nor the Chinese made an actual effort to mark the borders. This was a barren and desolate land where nothing grew. With no resources to mine and no commercial importance, the land lay uninhabited, lying between the towering ranges of the Karakrum and Kunlun mountains. In fact, Aksai Chin, the name given by the locals to this wasteland means desert of white stones. By this time, Russia was also starting to dominate the Central Asian lands and both countries were keen to avoid having a common border between them. The Pamir settlements of 1895 made sure that there weren't any doubts regarding territorial disputes between the Russians and the British on the North-West Indian borders. But the situation was still apathetic, to say the least, on the North-East border. Though both countries claimed the region, neither country made any serious attempts at defining the borders. In fact, one commander remarked, the country between the Karakrum and Kunlun ranges is, I understand, of no value, very inaccessible and not likely to be coveted by Russia. We might, I should think, encourage the Chinese to take it, if they showed any inclination to do so. This would be better than leaving a no man's land between our frontier and that of China. Moreover, the stronger we can make China at this point, the more useful she will be to us as an obstacle to Russian advance along this line. By the mid-1890s, the Chinese authorities had some knowledge of the border from Karakurum Pass to the Changcheng Mo River, and they claimed Aksai Chin as their territory. Through the first few decades of the 20th century, the British adhered to the policies made in earlier years. They aimed at maintaining Aksai Chin as part of Tibet, not Xinjiang, and most importantly, away from the Russians. But in 1911, the Chinese Revolution happened and the central government in China collapsed. British were uneasy with losing a buffer state between them and the Russians. Then the Second World War took British focus away from Aksai Chin. But by the end of the war, British atlases were showing the entire Aksai Chin region as belonging to India, just as they had done in 1865. By the time British left India and they received their independence in 1947, Indian government firmly established its borders at the edge of the Kunlun Mountains. In the 1950s, the Chinese built a 1200km road connecting Xinjiang and Tibet. And this road went right through Aksai Chin. No one outside of China knew this road existed until a few years after its completion when it started appearing in Chinese maps. India was furious. Aksai Chin was now more accessible to the Chinese than to the Indians. You had to cross the Karakurum mountains and steep valleys with unpaved roads and small footpaths in order to get to Aksai Chin from the Indian side. By the turn of the decade, there had been several isolated incidents and border skirmishes by patrol guards from both countries. 
Around this time, the Dalai Lama fleeing Tibet and seeking asylum in India did not help to relieve the rising tension between the two nations. Several meetings in 1960 between officials of the two countries failed because the Chinese Premier, Zhu Wenlai, wanted to mark the borders at the mccartney macdonald line, but the Indians wouldn't budge. They argued that China had never responded to previous attempts at establishing a proper border. When 1961 came along, things still remained unclear on where the boundary stood. Both countries upped their antiques trying to outdo each other. The Chinese started border patrols on the eastern borders, sometimes entering the Indian-held lands. The Indians, in response, started what was called the forward policy, where they built outposts behind the Chinese troops so as to cut off their supplies and force them to retreat. One Chinese newspaper quoted Mao Zedong as saying, Nehru wants to move forward and we won't let him. Originally, we tried to guard against this, but now it seems as if we cannot prevent it. He wants to advance. We might as well adopt armed coexistence. You wave a gun and I'll wave a gun and we'll stand face to face and can each practice our courage. The next year, fighting broke out between Indian and Chinese forces along the eastern border near Tagla and the Indian guards retreated from the region. Later, in October 1962, a Chinese offensive on the eastern border forced the Indians to retreat again. This time, severe fighting broke out as both nations poured thousands of soldiers to the borders for fighting. On the western front, China already controlled most of the disputed area. They quickly swept the region of any remaining Indian troops. By October 24, after just four days of fighting, the Chinese had conquered and secured the Pangong Lake, Galwan Valley and up to the Chipchap River. By mid-November, the Chinese Premier announced a unilateral ceasefire. China would not advance any further. Instead, they would fall back 20 kilometers from their positions and establish the present-day line of control. To this day, there is no proper agreement who really owns Aksai Chin. There were several small-scale skirmishes after 1962 in the 1980s and most recent one in 2010. But none of them escalated to the scale of outright war and the issue remains unresolved for the foreseeable future. <laughs>